from the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. We love you, Corey. See you again next week and on this show in between. We've got a lot to get to, so let's get straight into it now. Let's all jump back into a time machine for the start of tonight's show because it is instructive about the double standards that exist in Australian politics and, as always, the media that covers it. Remember the carbon tax promise of 2010. There'll be no carbon tax under a government I lead. Then, of course, we got one because the Greens demanded it. There, of course, was mass protests which took place around the country because Australians don't don't like being lied to, especially about something that was as significant as that. Well, in 2011, the protests got out the front of Parliament House and, very famously, the then opposition leader, future Prime Minister Tony Abbott, addressed a bunch of people who were particularly frustrated at the introduction of this tax. Notice Ken Wyatt in the background there and, of course, behind them, the now infamous Ditch the Witch sign. But as you remember, because we were on the airway back then, while the media went crazy about this particular sign... When you actually had a look at the raw footage, it showed that Tony Abbott had made his way through the crowd. He did not acknowledge the sign that was brought in behind him. So the idea that he was standing in front of a sign and endorsing what it said, of course, just was not true. But this did not matter. Because to this very day, there are still references to this as some sort of watershed terrible moment in Australian politics. In fact, Julia Gillard, when looking back at the politician who defeated her, well, of course, that was Kevin Rudd, but, of course, brought things back to level in 2010 and set up the scenario for her to lose her job in 2013, for Kevin Rudd to take back over was, of course, Tony Abbott. And like many a thing that has been rebrushed throughout history, the history that now many of our kids probably will learn about the experience of the first female Prime Minister is that along with defending Peter Slipper... In the Parliament, it's really about a misogyny speech, and despite the fact that Tony Abbott didn't know what the sign was behind him, he apparently had to go because somebody held up a sign behind him. There's a point to all of this history. I really don't know why this wasn't a career-ending moment for Tony Abbott. Sexism is no better than racism. But I'll defend Peter Slipper. You get the point, right? This was all, of course, her comments uh, immediately after the Labor Party had lost in 2013. Now, even 10 years later, they still talk about it. Literally, 2021, there's references to Ditch the Witch, the most terrible day of all time, and Parliament House is just as bad as it was back then, even though, as I've shown you, Abbott didn't know the sign that he was talking in front of. But I bring all of this to your attention today because for 10 years... A politician standing in front of a sign at a rally has apparently been an insight into the dark soul of the politician. Of course, not true, but still. That has been the narrative for the past 10 years. Well, let's talk about a Green senator, Maureen Faruqi. Now, no doubt she's already filled out the form to complain about this segment before she even knows what I have to say. And she is entitled to her view, as much as I disagree with it, about what is happening, particularly in the Middle East right now. But she, like many other Greens politicians, always tries to associate themselves with teenagers trying to hopefully turn them into the future Greens voters. That's why they want to lower the age of voting to 16. So she was at the school protests in favour of Palestine on Friday in Sydney. Now, okay. No surprise. We certainly know that she has said some very strong things in the Parliament. But I want to show you this now deleted post from her own social media. It shows Maureen Faruqi standing next to a collection of teenagers, including one with the horrific image of keep the world clean and an image of the Israeli flag being thrown into a bin. Now, there is nothing subtle about this image. It is about the death of a religious population. And not just in terms of who controls the lands of Israel or Palestine. No, no, the world. So including in New South Wales, the place where Maureen Faruqi is, of course, the representative for the Greens here in the wider country of Australia. Now, for 10 years, you have heard about Tony Abbott's complicity in not calling out the sign that was behind him. For 10 years, 
You have heard about the echoes of Ditch the Witch. And remember, one of the spectacular differences between that image, which was in the middle of the chaos of the protest, and the image that you have just seen, is that very obviously, Tony Abbott is addressing the great group of people that are in the crowd. He's not looking back. This is on the sideline of the protest in a posed photo that not only was posed for, it was taken, and presumably either by the senator herself or a member of staff, the image was considered appropriate enough to post to social media. Yet what was the collective response to this image of an Australian politician standing next to a teenager, a teenager, in 21st century Australia, who says, keep the world clean, Jews in the bin. Well, of course, the answer is tumbleweeds. Nothing. Have you seen much or any outrage about this whatsoever? Certainly all of the same people who screamed about Ditch the Witch have nothing to say here. No Labor politicians being asked about it in any of their media appearances, both yesterday or today. The Greens leader, who was up in uh, Newcastle, at an environmental protest, again, not asked about this question. Now, let's not muck around here. We are talking about someone holding up a poster saying that Jewish people should die. That's the point. To eradicate, to throw in the bin, to get rid of. And this politician seemingly has no blowback whatsoever. Now, thankfully, Maureen Faruqi is not the leader of a political party that will have a chance of forming a majority and becoming the Prime Minister of the country. But her vote is absolutely essential to anything getting passed through the Senate because it's the Greens and Labor that need to side together before they run off to David Pocock or Jackie Lambie. The Prime Minister must be asked tomorrow, is he willing to accept the vote in the Senate of a politician who didn't just accidentally take a photo with somebody holding it up in the background and they didn't see it. This is a person who posed with that poster, who saw the image or a member of her staff and then decided to post it. And it stayed up for a significant amount of time on the internet, now deleted, but still. No outrage, no questioning. Plenty of Labor politicians all over the TV today, over on the Insiders program, not a word about this today. In fact, this could be one of the first times you've heard about this since it happened on Friday. Now, let's wait back, let's sit and see what happens here. But there needs to be a level of accountability. The Senate has to censure a politician that is willing to stand up with such an image, as I would expect it to censure a far right-wing politician standing in front of any other similar messages. As I said before in the Sunday showdown, what I find galling about all of this is not a way of fake blowing up and fake getting annoyed on the behalf of a particular political constituency. It's about the standard that we set in Australia. Supplement any other racial group or gender or sexuality for the word Jews on that poster... And the reaction would understandably be febrile. The demands would be that this person should be censured by the Senate, their candidacy should not be renewed at the next election, and anyone preferencing such a person, well, it would be politically radioactive. But for some reason tonight, it's not. Now, whether that's because people either tacitly agree with the image, but I don't think that's the case... I think the reality is, is that uh, I'll give some people the benefit of the doubt that they say they're not going to have seen it. But the same media that spent so much time talking about Ditch the Witch could spend just, let's say, 5% of the same amount of time tomorrow talking about that photo. And I'm talking about every media organisation. Literally, we searched for this story, by the way, in the Channel 9 press. It doesn't exist. The Guardian, it doesn't exist. And again, the ABC News website, it doesn't exist. If I'm wrong, I'll correct that tomorrow. But my checking of things is I'm near certain that you have not seen this image in the wider public with an Australian politician standing... Show it again. Standing in front of, yes, a teenager, but a poster that, again, I disturbing content and all the rest of it. Clean up the world, throw the Jews in the bin. Honestly. No response. Nothing. 
Let's see if the Prime Minister somehow will get away with it. Well, let's see what he is asked tomorrow by the opposition, who I hope fire one at him in the Parliament. One for Penny Wong as well. But let's watch them equivocate. Meantime, speaking of where Adam Bant was this weekend in the port of Newcastle in New South Wales, well, many people decided to turn up to... Uh, send a message about climate change that Australia shouldn't be sending fossil fuel around the world. And they were all very excited about how many people had turned up. And, yes, they delayed coal ships coming in or out of the port of Newcastle for a grand total of two days. Oh, wow, the world has learnt its lesson. Unsurprisingly, the organisers say four trillion people turned up and it was the greatest moment since Santa gave out his first present. Unless there is a mass movement of ordinary people like me, uh, the future that we're looking at is short and bleak. Existential dread is real. They make movies about it now. We're at the, kind of the edge of the cliff. In fact, we're not even at the cliff, we're falling. We're starting to free fall. Projects like offshore wind, like new solar farms, are a priority at the moment. Australia produces 1%, 1% of climate emissions. And their argument is that what we dig up and send around the rest of the world, well, then that should also count for us as well. But even then, China is 30%. The developing world is the rest of what makes up half, half of what is bilged into the air each and every year. Adam Band again finding his way to connect with what he believes will be future forever Greens voters. Well, he was there. Someone, of course, should point out that the clothes that he was wearing, the life jacket that he was wearing and the thing he was paddling around in... None of it grows on a tree. The feeling here is just absolutely electric. Uh, there's nothing like people power as a good antidepressant when, you know, governments won't act, people will, and it feels great to be part of it. I say all of this is pointless because the coal drop-offs will start again this week. Oh, but our point was made. Now, apparently, uh, many people have been arrested in the past couple of hours because they were supposed to get out of the way by the time nightfall hit in Newcastle. Those people have now been arrested. And remember, interrupting things like ports, very significant offences in New South Wales. Now, no doubt, lay like many other people who have closed roads or tried to jump onto trains, will go before judges that will turn around and say, I understand, it's a very painful situation. But still, there'll be some difficulties for those who decided to stay on. Meantime... Former Defence Minister, former Agriculture Minister, Joel Fitzgibbon, who now uh, is part of the forestry lobby, well, he's turned around and had a go at the Labor Party, who, in many ways, fund the very same organisations that go off to court to have a go at the resources sector, who, of course, end up funding the federal government via their taxes. The attacks come after Labor fulfilled its electoral promise to reverse funding cuts to the Environmental Defender's Office providing $10 million in funding to the Community Legal Aid Centre over the Ford Estimates. The EDO is a legal organisation well known for its environmental advocacy running high-profile cases against coal and gas. Mr Fitzgibbon, who is the chair of Australian Forest Products Association, said it made no sense for the government to fund the activists to take legal action against the very government that gave them the money. Meantime... Blackout Bowen is now blank check Bowen when it comes to the projects that he's willing to fund to get us to the great green dream of 80% renewables by 2030. Now, as you know, he's been asked how much is this scheme going to cost? No answer whatsoever. The estimates, though, in the financial review, tens of billions of dollars, which is exactly what we told you, about at least $50 billion. Let's see what answers he has tomorrow in the Parliament, when no doubt he is asked by Peter Dutton. The government's energy policy continues to drive up inflation. The Prime Minister needs to stand up to take responsibility for the commitments that he gave in the election. The 97 times that he promised that he'd reduce electricity prices, he knew at that time he wasn't telling the truth. And, of course, the big idea that the alternative Prime Minister will take to the next election is that nuclear energy is part of the solution for Australia. A new polling, yes, advocacy polling, but still suggests that only one in five people in Australia actually oppose the moratorium that stops us even being able to look at this as a potential form of zero emissions energy. Now, as you know, the past few days have been very critical, as always, of the Queensland Government because it's a life-and-death issue now. 
Now, Anastasia Palaszczuk may well be trundling around the streets of Parliament or doing her best on social media to pretend that she's the Queen of Queensland and she keeps everyone safe, but the reality is that a problem that has been getting ever worse since she became the Premier, and she's not been the Premier for two minutes, she's now going for her fourth term. Ambulance ramping. This is when there are no hospital beds, which means you end up sitting in the back of an ambulance. When you sit in the back of the ambulance, no ambulance can go and answer a triple-O phone call. Now, this is a life and death matter. Why? Because, as we told you last week, a grandfather died in the back of an ambulance. And believe it or not, the family was not even told that that's where he died. Last week, we told you about the 51-year-old Brisbane mum, Kath Groom, who died because an ambulance never turned up. It was supposed to be there in 15 minutes. After 54 minutes, she went to bed, thinking she might be able to make it through the night. She didn't. On the very same day that her son graduated from Year 12. He is now, of course, an orphan because he lost his father as well. But on top of all of this, it is not just an every-now-and-then thing. Deaths in the health system happen for obvious reasons. But deaths through this type of, in my view, administrative negligence by not getting people into hospitals instead, sitting in the back of ambulances or waiting for ambulances, is a significant issue. There have been many this year, but we go back to the numbers that show us from 21 to 22 that it was about 20 people as well who also died. West Australian wrote about it at the time, that 20 deaths involving ambulance delays or rampling at hospitals in Queensland um, outlined the significant incident. And this was done by uh, Queensland Ambulance Service. They have never updated those numbers. Geez, I wonder why. And there, of course, is a Queensland Premier who thinks that if she just says more money for hospitals, then people will be stupid enough to actually fall for it. But the reality of people's experiences with the health system in Queensland is horrific. Well, we have the scenario now where the new health minister, who was the former attending general, the former health minister, who had to go because, among other things, 20 people died as a result of ambulance ramping. There were two last week in Queensland, yet this minister stays on. And then there is another heartbreaking issue. For the most obvious of reasons, you know why this matters to me. Thea's legacy. Heartbroken mum alleges catastrophic hospital failures. This is Meg, she's a mum, and she's lost her first child. The daughter of the first time mum, Meg, died in catastrophic circumstances just hours after being born at Redcliffe Hospital in September. Meg alleges that her baby, Thea, was met with an empty oxygen tank and malfunctioning equipment and her concerns were not being taken seriously enough. Her child died. When finding the cameras to talk about this, the Deputy Premier Stephen Miles, well, in my view, shed crocodile tears. Oh, it's, a, it's a very sad story, and um, uh, 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 Meg um, came to my election office during, the, during last week and, and shared it with us, and we've been um, doing our best to support her. And I say that because in the same interview, with the same brushing aside of people like Meg, brushing aside of people like Kath, brushing aside of the many other people who have had these horrible experiences with the health system that the Labor Party has been in charge of for the best part of a decade. They've got all the unions on their side. They could fix this. Instead, they're deciding to spend billions of dollars knocking down the Gabba and rebuilding it and hosting the 2032 Olympics because their assumption is that Queensland voters are so selfish that as long as it doesn't happen to their family, then they won't punish the government for what has happened to other people's families. But the reality, of course, of emergencies is no-one sees them coming. That's why you have to care, and I know you do, about these situations, because it could well be you, your daughter, your father, your family member, your granddaughter. Well, this is what, again, Stephen Miles, fresh after the fake tears and choking it all back, had to say. I don't think you can take one example and extrapolate that out to the system. I know many, many people who have uh, really good experiences. It's the immediate want to spin their way out of it that gives you the idea they are not taking it seriously. Now, you can't have a health system where every single person who interacts with it gets healthier as a result. There are obvious conditions and obvious circumstances that mean, sadly, people die. But when you've got a mother saying that her newborn baby was being treated with an oxygen tank that wasn't full, 
when you've got a 51-year-old woman who felt she had chest pains on the very same day that her son had graduated from year 12, called the ambulance, but when he didn't turn up after an hour, went to bed and then was dead the next morning, or the man whose family were not even told that he had died in the back of an ambulance, you have a systemic problem. And until the government stands up, takes it on the chin and offers no excuses, no excuses, then you don't have a government that gets it. Again, I hope against hope because the polls, they can often be wrong and the BS machine that is run out of the government in Brisbane is incredibly powerful. It's links back to the establishment media in Queensland very strong. Because for many people who work in Queensland media, their great hope one day is to turn around and work for the state government. Because either they're young and it's a way to get a quick promotion or they go and work for the government because it's a way of extending their careers that would otherwise have ended on Mount Cutha. That's where the TV stations are located. But thankfully, there are options and Queensland has a chance to change to people who get it, people who plan to make a change at the next election in Queensland. It's, it's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. And, and yet again, we, the government will say we're going to do a review and we're full of remorse, but there's never accountability and there's never action. Sadly the case. All right, let's talk now about economics because this week we're going to get even more inflation data. Some predictions are that it will be ever so slightly higher than where it has been for the past couple of months, which of course are ever so higher than where it has been uh, for a few months before that. The reality of Albanese and Chalmers in charge of the Australian economy is that they are only uh, looking after one thing, and that is the budget bottom line. And because they have been struck by the best form of lightning possible, they, of course, end up with a budget surplus, not through great management, because they've turned around and they've got a mining sector that's going through the roof. They've got an immigration system, which is bringing in hundreds of thousands of extra people, all of which end up, or many of which, end up paying extra taxes. And, of course, they're able to use the profits of the future fund. But we are now halfway through Albanese's first term in office. Let's look at the central promise that he made before he became Prime Minister, that a Labor government will lower the cost of living. Well, here we are, 18 months in. And fuel, 19% compared to this time last year. Electricity, up 18% compared to this time last year. Gas and fuels, up 12%. Transport, up 9%. Bread and cereal products, you know, optional stuff, is up the best part of 9%. Insurance and financial services, about 8.5%. Dairy and related products, 8%. Rents, 7.6%. Tobacco, 7.5%. Housing, 7.2%. Food products, 68 And health, 54 Now, they want to pretend there's some big global situations involved in all of this. Well, of course, we know when it comes to the energy situation, it's their own policies. When it comes to petrol, they won't cut the petrol taxes, despite having the money to do it, to announce it tomorrow, to show at the very least they get it, but also just to relieve the pressure ever so slightly of anyone who needs something transported to their shop or wants to get around for their work or for their personal life. Meantime, even news.com.au is noticing the problem that this Prime Minister has, which is he can cuddle up to China as much as he wants and clink golden glasses with Joe Biden. Let's have a look at this. Via macro business, news.com.au quotes here, that real household disposable income craters... Now, obviously, it was very high in the period of time where we were all locked inside, but then once that uh, was led away, funk, through the floor, meaning you have less money to spend on everything that costs more. How does that compare to the rest of the world? We're very badly. We are doing worse than Norway, Sweden, Ireland, Austria, Italy, Canada, Netherlands, Germany, Hungary, Finland, Belgium, France, Denmark, Port pardon me, Portugal, United States, Poland, Slovenia, United States, Chile and Spain. Oh, but it's all global. And then despite the fact that you have all these extra costs, there's, of course, the extra cost, which can be anywhere between fourteen dollars and $30,000 since these people came to power, about paying off your home. Interest rates, the full elbow dozen, plus the one before the last election, means 13. 13 rises with an uninterrupted up, 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 up since this bloke became the Prime Minister. If you're unfortunate enough to be somebody who is renting, I don't say that because I look down on renters, it's because I feel your pain here. According to the RBA and the ABS, rental inflation, oh, look at that. We are now way back to where we were around GFC times. Fewer places for more money. 
Which, of course, is one of the reasons why on this program we remain as relentless as we do about this government's very high policies when it comes to immigration. Now, as you know, hundreds of thousands of people due to arrive this year, about one and a half million over the next few years, and all of that is great for the federal budget because more people, more taxes grow the pie, but the reality is they need to live somewhere. And while we know that we're moving towards the best part of 40 million people that will be here in the next 40 years or so, New South Wales and Victoria will need to find room for more than one million extra residents within the next 10 years, underscoring the growing challenge confronting governments in providing affordable housing. Oh, infrastructure, you know, that stuff that they say they can't afford anymore, and essential services, what, like health, that would mean the triple O system that doesn't work in Victoria, 33 people died as a result of it, or two people dying in a week because of the hospital ramping or ambulance situation in Queensland. City of Melbourne will bear the brunt of this population growth, expanding by an extra 772,000 people and almost 950,000 people, respectively, by 2032. So when the Brisbane Olympics are happening, Melbourne and Sydney have grown by the best part of a million people. Those numbers via the far right-wing think tank, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And again, the issue with all of this, the decisions that are being made, this has nothing to do with war in Ukraine or what's going on in the Middle East. These are decisions by this government to use the Ponzi scheme of immigration to turn around and fix their budget bottom line. More people, more tax, more tax, good for government. Government equals surplus. Surplus equals better economic management, where the reality is, is that those people have nowhere to live because the existing population has nowhere to live. The existing population does not have a health system that works for them. So what about? Remember one of the first things Jim Chalmers promised that they'd have one and a half million homes in 10 years? Now, of course, they don't build homes. Instead, they just have this number that they turn around and have a look at. Well, surprise, surprise, the Albanese government set to fall 200,000 short of its target of 1.2 million homes by 2029. The Housing Industry Association underlying the urgent need for an ease in regulatory tax burdens to drive more supply. But there will be more than 1.2 million people who end up coming into the country in the next few years. So, hear me out. Currently, not enough places to rent. Currently, not enough houses for all the people in the country. More people will not match in the growth of housing due in the next few years. But, you know, nothing to see here. Because the real action, well, you'll see it all, of course, in question time tomorrow. All of it. When in trouble, break glass and blame Dutton. Now, of course, Parliament will be back in the next little while and this gives the opportunity for the Prime Minister to stand up and pretend that the opposition leader is the story. Not the government that made the promises, that broke the promises, that is failing to deal with the domestic issues of inflation, that is so arrogant that while it flies around the world in private jets, it will not cut petrol taxes for you. And one of the three major opinion polls are starting to show that there is a change in support for the government at the moment. Now, I wouldn't bet my house on this. I still think we're talking about a potential minority government. But when even lefty Laura Tingle is writing in her commentary that the government are not in control and voters are not listening, then there might be a slight problem. Add to that, of course, clueless Claire O'Neill as the Home Affairs Minister. And there's some new detail about just how many people have been let out into the community after the High Court ruling and this government's failure to have any legal set up for it, or Andrew Giles, the Immigration Minister, who wants to talk more about racism than whether or not people are wearing ankle bracelets, then the reality is that, of course, the only thing they have to do is to turn around and blame Dutton, blame Dutton, blame Dutton, because, yes, The Guardian, the Channel 9 newspapers, the ABC, social media, well, they're all just waiting to put the devil horns on the Leader of the Opposition. But you see, this is the Joe Biden trick, which is to say, look, I know it's not been anything like what we promised, but we promise you the other guy is so much more worse than we are. Tony Burke now claims that Labor is cleaning up the mess left by Peter Dutton. Oh, yeah, Peter Dutton's the problem when it's come to national security, not clueless Claire O'Neill. We're introducing legislation because we want to get it through, and we want to get it through quickly because there's a massive problem that's been left by Peter Dutton's neglect. Peter Dutton's neglect. If that was the case, they would have had the legislation ready on day one when Parliament returned after the High Court. Instead, no, we had to wait to the end of the week. And then it was take it or leave it. And then it was Peter Dutton who saved the government from themselves and, among other things, got them to introduce bans on these people going anywhere near kids. Please. Oh, yeah, and just a little reminder to the Prime Minister that, you know, he's here to help. 
Jim Chalmers, this time last week, was uh, doing a little profile piece telling us how fit he is, wink, wink, fit enough to run the country, showing us how friendly he is with local businesses and minority populations, wink, wink, I'm ready to lead. But then, of course, all of those Canberra Colombo types who always just chase every little lead down the drain, they sort of ignored this one from the uh, profile piece. I remarked that there was also talk of him, that being Jim Chalmers, cutting a bit loose socially, my words, around Parliament House. His response, because I was drinking too much. So what, have you, what did you do? What went wrong? When did you know that you'd hit the wrong moment? Any plans for those questions? Of course not. They're for a Labor politician. Looking forward to a big conversation this evening, a big debate. It starts right now. Join us, Paul, at skynews.com.au is my email. Socials are all the way uh, the same. Just go looking for Paul Murray Live. And if you're on threads, good luck to you. More in a sec. With us now to discuss so much news, including breaking news. News poll has just dropped in the Australian newspaper. And as Peter Van Onselen used to tweet out, news poll, wow. We'll get to that in a moment or two's time. But first, right now, none other than James Patterson, of course, who's the Liberal senator, but more importantly, a senator who represents all of Victoria for his sins he's in Canberra, a man who's very happy because Dave Sharma gets up, not Andrew Constance in New South Wales. It's not Michael Kroger, of course, the uh, v former Victorian Liberal Party president. <laughs> it's the Labor man, the Labor man who was death riding Constance. I was with him, by the way. Of course, in none other than Stephen <laughs> Conroy. Um, and, of course, the, as I said, the wonderful Michael Kroger. All right, now, we're all going to go uh, with this together because it's literally happened in the past couple of minutes. So, news poll, two-party preferred, 50-50. Right now, uh, the LNP's primary vote, way up to 38. Labor, down to 31. Uh, the Greens at 13. Others at 12. One Nation at 6. Stephen, I'll start with you. Now, midterm slumps, formally confirmed. People previously had rolled their eyes at things like the, um, the Morgan poll. Well, now, news poll, the gold standard, the one that uh, the Liberal Party's dumped many a Prime Minister over, Labor as well, 50-50. Well, I'm sure that it'll give the caucus, you know, a uh, reason to pause. So I would expect that they would all want to mark down the, uh, the last few months as pretty average and be looking forward to getting through this week of Parliament, hopefully only this week of Parliament for their sakes. I know what it's like to uh, have to sit an extra week into December or so. Uh, so I would think they'd be very keen to get through Parliament, get out uh, and try and reset uh, over the Christmas break. But it's no real surprise. If you look at the uh, cost of living issues and you've talked about some of them, uh, you've ignored the, the, most, the biggest single reason for cost of living pressures, and that's profiteering by companies. Uh, that doesn't get a Guernsey in, in any of your discussion, Paul, just like Michelle Bullock can't utter the words, you know, company-driven inflation. She has to blame going to the dentist and going to the Because I remember hairdresser. you said that all I, the way I'm, through the 2022 Michelle, Michelle, election. Michelle, I've actually put my haircut back all three that. days. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you on the Reserve Bank Governor so comment. That, that particular comment back. was dumb, but you only, get, you only get to play that card once and it was played effectively on the, on the no, previous I've, run. I've, I've put my haircut off three days because <laughs> she's urged me to not go to the, hair, <laughs> the uh, hairdresser as often. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm following her orders. All right, Michael, let's save him. Well, uh, I told you is, last week... Yeah, you, I, told, you told us this. I told Again, you last week... In the think, wind, you had a little feeling think, here. Things were getting worse. Yeah, things were getting worse for him. Look, the problem is the electorate are not going to forgive this bloke for wasting $500 million trying to sell to them a proposition involving constitutional change that he hadn't even read. And this is, this is the guts of what the problem is. Albanese has been on another planet, often in another country, uh, over the last six to 12 months, and he is totally disconnected from the struggles of day-to-day -day Australians. And if his junior ministers think they're going to recover their standing by attacking Peter Dutton on national security issues, I mean, bring it on. Dutton's, Dutton's, you know, standing in the community on border protection, on immigration, illegal boat arrivals, etc., refugees, is extremely strong. It's a very strong brand narrative of Dutton. And it'd be like saying us saying Whitlam was no good on Medicare. You know, he's terrible on Medicare. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't cut it anywhere in the community. So what this bloke needs to do is try and refocus on some policy ideas. But the problem he's got is that his vote is going the way of the voice. Mm. Uh, it's just going worse and worse. 
Um, he's certainly going to lose his majority in the next election. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. Mm. And yeah. I said last week, much to the criticism I got from Stephen, uh, Dutton's got a reasonably good chance of becoming Prime Minister. They'll well, both okay. get in the low 70s if you add Labor, Green to Labor. Yeah. So, something I want to point out about that, though, which is um, that... While the Labor vote is well and truly down, Green vote has held pretty steady, which means the preference flow issues. But I agree. We are talking at this moment about a minority government. But 18 months feels like a long time ago in that direction. It's a bloody long way in that direction as well. Um, I think one of the biggest issues here, of course, uh, uh, Senator, has been the disgraceful handling of the government in the post-High Court decision. Now... The High Court made its decision. We were told uh, that, oh, well, there's nothing we can really do about it. High Court's made its decision. Uh, oh, but then we can come up with some legislation a few days later that apparently we've been preparing for months. But then they needed... Peter Dutton to help plug a lot of the holes in all of it. And we even learned tonight via reporting that I think is in the, uh, the Financial Review, let me double check my number here, is that now the number of people that have uh, been released as a result, we're now at 141 people. Uh, they thought this thing was going to be like the Syrian brides coming back from the ISIS brides, sort of two-day story, blow up on Sky News. Well, guess what? It wasn't, it isn't, and I think it's one of the, uh, the concrete uh, shoes that they're wearing at the moment. Paul, it would be a big mistake for me or any of my colleagues to do a victory lap after one competitive news poll. No, we know we've got a lot more work to do to earn the trust of the Australian people and we are on our way to doing that. Um, but I agree with you. I'm not surprised after the shocking two weeks that the government has had that it's taken a hit. And you're absolutely right. I mean, they were caught napping by the High Court. They did not anticipate this decision. They were not prepared for this decision. They weren't ready to act to protect the community when this decision was handed down. And it took a very messy week of scrambling and pressure from us and the media before they finally realised that they should act after initially saying they wouldn't do anything until the High Court handed down its published reasons, which will be sometime next year. Even then, what they introduced was far too weak and had to be significantly strengthened by the way of six amendments that we put forward. And now we have this daily drip of finding out how many more people are beyond the single applicant to the High Court who have been released? If it's in the 140s, as you say, that's news to me. I haven't been briefed on that by the government. I'll be asking them about that tomorrow. Right. What I want to know also is how many of those 141 are under electronic monitoring? Because the government last week wasn't able to answer that question, wasn't able to say how many of these people are being electronically monitored, as they promised they would be, because we forced them to make that a mandatory condition. Well, I tell you what, you want to see some... This is, again... Clueless Claire O'Neill is lucky for about one thing. You're in the upper house, all right? Because I tell you what, we'll see. She'll get the heat tomorrow. And then, uh, this week, of course, as Parliament's back. But wait, watch and see. Also, again, as I'm trying to read the analysis, while live uh, interpreting all of this as well, apparently the uh, disapproval, approval rating scenario for the Prime Minister is in the realms of Scott Morrison before the 2022 election. Now... Let's also take a chill pill here to some degree, which is, Stephen, you have seen governments that are on the rise and the ones that once it falls, it really falls. Um, there's a story that's been given in The Australian tomorrow, which is, uh, you know, more university students should have greater English tests at, uh, applied to them. OK. Uh, these all feel like a little bit of stop the bleeding along the way. All right, what's the free advice that you want to give from a 1,000 kilometres down the road? Yeah, well, look, I think there's been a couple of stories over the weekend which have indicated the government have a fairly major announcement to make uh, relatively soon around migration levels. Uh, the part of the problem, though, when you want to talk about housing, Paul, and you want to talk about rental problems and the lack of supply, is that someone's got to build those houses that we need today. Yep. Uh, and if you look at one of the other stories in the papers is there are not enough builders in the country with unemployment it, between 3 and 4% to Absolutely. actually do that job. Uh, and this is where you get the conundrum between wanting to keep the flow of workers needed to keep the economy actually functioning, providing homes is a fairly basic function of an economy, <laughs> uh, and the argument around how much migration you want to have. Now, let's be clear about this migration debate. It's... it's 200,000, I think, roughly, is the cap on permanent migration. And a large cohort of this is students who are coming in. And there is special, specialised student accommodation that is available to them that other Australians don't use. They're specifically purpose-built for student accommodation. So 
pretending that all of those students who are coming in are suddenly taking away houses and rentals from Australians no, is just as, frankly as, dishonest. No, but as we've had, but as we've had a look at, at, at the real estate information, when there's a rental place available in Ipswich, 121 people turn up for a rental property in Ipswich. Now I love Ippy, God love, uh, God love CSI, open till 4 a.m. Love it, right? Uh, God love River 949. No problems with Ipswich, but that is an example of what we know is the, demi the demand versus the supply scenario that's here. Um, Senator, obviously, as Home Affairs, it's not your immediate purview, but immigration does fold in in all of this. Can the government find a way to keep both of its masters happy, which is the people who are standing in the ever-growing queues uh, for a variety of services around the country and the Treasury that quite like the idea that despite the fact they get their numbers wrong all the time, every time, as we all know, in both directions, they need to hold on to a surplus going into a political uh, trade-off, which I think now is looking like 2025 rather than late 2024. Well, Paul, what it will require from the government is for them to take responsibility, lead and make some difficult decisions. I mean, we've had an excuse from them from the last 18 months that they've got no control over the immigration numbers, that there's nothing that they can do about it. And that has led to more than 500,000 people coming to Australia this year. We're probably going to break the all-time record for my overseas migration to our country. And the government has been watching, standing by, saying it's completely out of our control. Well, I think they've probably realised that in a cost of living crisis, when you've got a home affordability crisis, a rental affordability crisis, and many other really serious financial pressures on families, that this isn't helping and they might actually have to do something about it. But only after about a year's worth of free advice from our shadow immigration minister, Dan Tehan, who's mm. been pointing this out to them week in, week out. And finally, I think they might belatedly act because they realise it's, it's a real problem for them. Yeah, well, by the way, of course, remember, of course, they're still pretending uh, that, uh, you know, nothing to do with the Australian government here. Inflation's all something to do with the international... Fi well, anyway, uh, we will continue all of that. Yes, profiteering is part of it. And by the way, uh, no shout-out to Coles, which I learned uh, today. After posting a billion-dollar profit this year, they're giving their workers, like, extra points. Not a $1,000 bonus, not a $50 this, that, and that. They're giving me sort of extra bonus points in some loyalty scheme, please. All right, quick break. Back with more. We do it as it happens, including the polls, but now we turn to other things, including Maureen Faruqi. Anyone going to try and cancel her? Thanks for watching Big Sunday Night. So you can't miss the Sunday Night Show. There's stuff happening all the time. Appreciate that you watch us as often as you do. Remember, send me an email, paul at skynews.com.au. Senator James Patterson is here with former Senator, the wonderful Stephen Conroy, and the equally wonderful but never quite a Senator. I'm sorry, Michael. That's just the way it was. Michael Kroger. <laughs> um, now, let's, uh, let's oh, talk well. about a, a few things here. Now, again, before Maureen Faruqi, again, intentionally tries to take what I just said going into the break out of comment here, cancel, of course, does not mean anything physical. Physical, nothing violent at all. It's about the metaphorical idea about somebody losing their standing in the community as a result of saying or do, doing something stupid, all right? I just say that because there's the half listening and we all know how this game is played. Um, Michael, ditch the witch I showed everyone. We all know we all lived through those 10 years. Where the hell is the condemnation of a person who didn't just have someone randomly run up behind them, but instead poses for a photo with a kid, and I'm sorry, yes, we're talking about a teenager here, but stands with someone holding a poster essentially saying, kill the Jews? It just shows you the utter hypocrisy of the left, doesn't it? I mean, you know, we saw what they said about that, but what are they saying about this, you know... Faruqi, nothing. They're all completely silent. Where's The Guardian and uh, the ABC attacking her? They're not, of course. Where are the, the left-wing uh, you know, Twitterati attacking her? Of course, they're not. But it leads to this conclusion, um, which is to second the remarks made by Julian Lisi yesterday in the Australian newspaper, um, which is it's time for the Liberal Party now to adopt a policy of putting the Greens last uh, across Australia every in every time. election, 100%. in every how-to-vote card, every time. Uh, there was a moment years ago where I thought they were becoming a bit more centrist on Israel and the Jewish community, but no. This is an anti-Jewish political party, uh, to put it at its very mildest. I would use stronger words, but perhaps I shouldn't. Uh, these people should be below One Nation and below the Labor Party. They are an intolerable, disgraceful, anti-Jewish uh, uh, organisation, which means there's elements of racism in parts of the Green Movement and we've seen them attend rallies where they've been, people have been yelling out 
uh, you know, from the river to the sea, which is which is calling for a holocaust against Israel and the Jewish people, etc., etc., etc. There is no place for the Green Movement anywhere in any parliament in this country because of their disgusting, vile views. And the Liberal Party amount now must put them last everywhere as an article of faith. And uh, congratulations to Julian Lisa, Lisa for pointing that out. And also, by the way, for calling for a, an inquiry, perhaps a Royal Commission, into anti-Semitism in Australian universities, which is now at dangerous levels. Uh, James, what can happen in the Senate? I know you can't boot somebody out. That, you know, she's there to represent, uh, as she does. Um, but surely tomorrow, all bar her colleagues can have some sort of censure for somebody who does not fully apologise in any way, shape or form for the image that was sent around the internet. Well, Paul, the Greens are the first people to come into the Senate chamber and demand others be censured for things that they have said or do done that crosses their imaginary mm. lines of offence. And they have a, frankly, very low bar for that. Anything mildly out of step with their worldview, anything mildly as that strays from the politically correct line, they think should be censured. Frankly, actually, I don't agree with this principle of going in and censuring senators. We're all elected democratically to represent our constituents and we all be judged by our constituents, not by each other. We're not a club that judges each other. It's our constituents who decide whether we should be there and what we should say. And actually, it's electorate that needs to punish the Greens. And this is a disgracefully irresponsible and dangerous thing for them to do. To pose for this photo, to post this photo, to realise after people pointed out what was in there, delete it but not apologise for it, reflects very poorly on Maureen Faruqi, reflects very poorly on the Greens, who, of course, were fanning the flames of these protests from to begin with, and it's totally unsurprising we've seen acts of anti-Semitism at them. So they should hang their heads in shame and they should deal with this themselves. Yeah, I mean, Stephen, organisationally, I get why the numbers matter, the numbers always matter, but at some point, uh, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party at times need to preference each other because there are detestable options on the ballot, including in this case... Um, the Greens. Yeah, look, I mean, the Greens political party are just filth. Just absolute filth. I mean, the sort of anti-Semitic outpouring that they're encouraging. There are children afraid to go to school in their uniforms. There are people afraid to go to their synagogue to worship. Uh, and if this was in any way happening to uh, Muslims around mosques, there will be an outcry. Uh, and Australians need to stand up, and particularly Australians who believe or think they're on the progressive left side of politics. You are, when you walk in a march, when you stand next to people who are chanting from the uh, river to the sea, you are calling for the extermination of the state of Israel. This is not Labor policy. This is not uh, left policy. You are barracking for Hamas's policy. And Hamas are a barbaric organisation that should be hunted down for what they did. And it is, it is just extraordinary that she refuses to apologise or tries to pretend it didn't happen. Mm. Uh, and she deserves the full force of condemnation, whether it's in the chamber or outside of the chamber, for what she's doing. But tragically, she's not alone. The well, entire Greens political party are just filth. Well, as I say, supplement the word Jews for any race, any sexuality, any gender and what would everyone's yeah, reaction yeah. be. Why is it this... It, yeah, yeah. So test for the PM. We'll see where we are in 24 hours. Lads, do appreciate it. Sorry we got distracted with polls. There are lots of other issues to get to. We shall do so again soon. Quick break. Back with more. I had a spectacular weekend and I didn't leave the house. I'll explain why next. When good things happen to good people, it is a wonderful time. And that is exactly what happened this weekend. Brody Kostecki is the Supercars champion for 2023. And how's this for celebrating at the end of the race in Adelaide? <laughs> If I wasn't wearing shorts, you'd get a standing ovation, son. Uh, it was part of the overall celebrations of becoming the champion, but also his team, the Coca-Cola Racing by Erebus team that have gone from the middle of the pack to the absolute front of the pack this year has been incredible to see. And I've got to say in particular, Betty and Daniel Clemenko, Betty in the middle, Daniel holding the trophy, they've done everything. They've done everything in sport, in the sport that we all love. They are beautiful friends. I'm so proud of them. And to the team bosses, Barry and Shannon, congrats. All round, well done, Erebus. Well done. 